Good morning. Um, first, I just want to acknowledge uh, the Regional Council and thank Tim for inviting me here to share a little bit of our, our work over the last nine years. So just to give you, a, 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 by way of a little bit of background, as I said, um, first started looking at fisheries about nine years ago. I'd actually spent 20 years running different companies in, in China, came back to New Zealand, um, returned uh, to the university, and I really started to get interested in the industry because it occurred to me and certainly some of my colleagues that they didn't seem to be making much money and having much fun. So we're very focused on, on the business model. And what we found is, is that in our early work was that, you know, the, by and large, the legacy driven, you know, driven through history. And we actually looked at the, the models back to about 1867 and very focused on this bulk harvesting, you know, kind of commodity way of, of, of um, extracting value from the resource. And enormous cost minimization pressures, which is what got us interested into the, the deep sea. We definitely uh, uh, had a look into the lack of traceability and more recently, you know, enforcement and that. And over that time, uh, our team has evolved. So we now have experts from a number of universities, including, you know, Oxford, University of British Columbia, who we did the catch reconstruction with, and more recently, Otago and Waikato. And we bring a very multidisciplinary approach and the reason for that is, as we found, um, by and large, enormous amounts of money is spent under the water trying to find out what's going on with fish populations, impact on the ecosystems and so on, and counting fish. But really, there was not much understanding about what was happening on the fishing boats or understanding you know, the behaviours or the business models and the value chains of the very people who relied on, you know, on actually carrying out the harvesting activities. So, <clears throat> 2010, we, as part of the, uh, our work into the business model, it came to our attention that there was um, some pretty serious human rights and labor abuses going on in the deep sea sector. And what we found truly shocked us that led to a ministerial inquiry after we engaged with the PM's office um, and subsequently uh, changes to both Immigration Crimes Act and, of course, the Fisheries Bill. Um, one of the uh, findings of that work that's never been made public, we were able to track um, some of these issues back to about 1983, and we estimate that from 83 to at least 2000, and 12, as many as 45,000 migrant workers have been subjected to explo exploitation in the deep sea fishing industry. And some of those, um, you'll remember from the media, uh, there were some pretty significant problems, including um, torture. And one of the things that we did come across is how these men were forced to commit certain fisheries crimes in terms of misreporting and dumping of catch. Oops, not working. Got it. So following that work, uh, Br University of British Columbia reached out to us in 2012, and they'd actually already been carrying out work to reconstruct the marine catches globally. And, and they had put together 150 expert teams of more, more than 400 researchers. We uh, agreed to work with them, um, and it was clear to us that the catch data or the catch statistics was wanting, and we had quite a lot of evidence for that that we'd already gathered from our work into the um, foreign charter sector. And as some of the crew told us at that time, entire catches on the, on the trawlers we're talking about, not the longliners, um, some of those catches up to 100 ton, the entire catches were, were just dumped. And that's it. a good example of that is what happened to the Oyang 70 when it sank with the loss of six lives. And it sank because it was trying to haul in about 120 ton of bag of fish and it flipped the boat. 
So <coughs> the findings that came out of the global work was that in 96, they'd found that the um, global catches had peaked and in fact the reported catch was 53% higher than what the FAO um, thought it was and that catches were declining faster than the Food and Agriculture Organization also thought by about 2% a year and that the oceans are in trouble if we don't do something about it. So <clears throat> there's been a little bit of criticism from the industry, understandably so, um, of the methodology. So I thought I'd just briefly go through it. Um, the methodology has been published in, in Nature Communications with the global findings. But where we deviated a little bit, I won't go through the whole thing given the time, but where we have deviated a little bit from what was done overseas is we got some pretty good data here from grey literature and, and particularly thanks to the Ministry of Primary Industries. Um, they had a number of reports that we were able to use. Uh, in fact, over 300 operation reports informed the reconstruction of New Zealand catches. You'll be aware of one of those, the famous Operation Achilles that led to the, the Heron Inquiry. Um, Complementing those reports, we also drew on expert knowledge from over 300 compliance officers, observers, and particularly the fishermen themselves. Um, we've spoken to hundreds of fishermen. They're a great bunch of people to talk to, and if you want to know about fishing, always talk to a fisherman. In a nutshell, our findings found that the unreported catch was roughly 25 million tonnes between 1950 and 2013. Now, that was about 2.7 times what was reported. Now, now, it raised the question, how can this be? And there's a number of reasons for it. We identified nine different types of drivers of, of dumping. But what has been missed out from the media is, in fact, uh, it's not just fishermen. There's a certain amount of black market activity that we are aware of from time to time. And our actual catch reporting system, despite it being lauded as world leading, it's clearly not. And, and uh, maybe I can take some questions and go into that a little bit um, more after this. Um, this particular diagram, for which I acknowledge um, the Ministry of Primary Industries, it's from one of their internal documents, neatly sums up the situation. So we have this current, um, we, we have the situation where there's a cycle of non-reporting and what the discard working groups and better, better information, better value working groups within the Ministry have been trying to do since the late 2000s is actually shift uh, what was going on in the fishing industry to the green cycle or the cycle of reporting. But as you can see there, it's quite clear that if they, because there have been comments in the media that, well, what's this got to do with sustainability? Well, this is the ministry's own um, illustration of what it's got to do with sustainability. If catches are not reported, it, it, it gives uncertain catch data. That means uncertain stock assessments or stock assessments that are clearly wrong. We get poorly set TACs. Um, very often you talk to fishermen, they will tell you themselves the TACs are not correct. Uh, that's something I, I agree. And then of course you get ineffective control and enforcement we saw that with Operation Achilles, it's not the only one, and then the cycle starts again. So that is the problem. Yeah, and the, um, just to explain the jargon, the TACs is the total allowable catch. From the TACs, they uh, you know, deduct customary recreation, which is about 2.7 of the total TAC at the moment. And, the and then they take off other sources of mortality and the balance is the commercial catch. 
And of course, Dave Turner's famous email, acknowledging that discarding is a systematic failure of the fisheries management. Now, that is not the only document with comments like that in it, um, but it's probably uh, one of the few emails. So we do agree with the ministry that the commercial fishers are trapped in the cycle of non-reporting. Um, in, in 2007, you'll, you'll see that, that upper quote, um, that was the rationale back in the 2000s, in the, in the late 2000s, again, why we needed accurate catch data. It, it, um, and it, it, it's not about just what they're landing on the vessel, it's what they're not landing because it, it goes into the stock assessment. So we take the view that, you know, the QMS is a data-hungry beast and it's been starving for a long time. I was asked um, last week, actually, to comment, you know, or to answer a question here today whether I believe there was a culture of waste. I wouldn't say it's so much a culture of waste as it is a culture of legacy of traditional practices. And, and to understand that, you need to understand the history of the fishing industry. Um, but around the turn of the century, uh, and, and in the, the mid, particularly in the mid 1800s, lobster was only fed to slaves. No self-respecting white person would be seen eating one, you know, and that was the fact. And then when finally there were some rules put in place that you couldn't make a, a, a servant or a slave eat lobster more than three nights a week, they turned it into fertilizer. <laughs> and then eventually someone, uh, a guy took some to Boston and cooked them, and the rest is history. We had the same thing here in New Zealand, 1962. The fishing industry told the Scott Inquiry, Parliament's investigation, that only Maori ate power. It's a culture. And that, that there was absolutely no market overseas, uh, particularly among Europeans, for power. We've now got this kind of same argument going on with um, spiny dogfish, who the government's been trying to get the industry to land and export to the UK since before the Second World War. And um, they're prolific. We've had the same with red cod. It's a culture. So it's not so much a culture of waste, it's a culture of value, of what they don't value. And as we know from trade me, somebody else's rubbish is somebody else's, you know, jewel. So it is worth money. It's a perception problem. Yes, it is a culture of waste, but it's a perception problem. But it's not just the fishermen. It's us, what we eat. It's the ministry. It's our regulators. It's our politicians, you know, because we're, we're accepting of, of this is worth money, but this is not. But ha as with lobster and as with power, attitudes um, change and it's and of course the linkage here today with the seabirds is, as we found in our journey but it wasn't part of our research we also found um, seabird misreporting is a huge issue and there was an ERA uh, decision earlier this year um, which described the torture and killing and misreporting of, of seabirds which certain people in the industry had been doing ever since the introduction of the quota management system. So it's kind of sad that some of these messages are, are still not getting through. But as I was talking to a, a fisherman just before uh, this presentation, um, one of the biggest problems is the perverse incentives in the QMS itself. The, the Deem Value System incentivizes these guys to throw what they perceive to be valueless fish because they don't think we want to eat it. And you could imagine if it was lobster or, or power. Um, and for many, as I found talking to the fishing, you know, the fishermen, particularly in the inshore, there's a sense of hopelessness, particularly with what's going on with the cameras. Um, 
and, and the new electronic monitoring system, and they feel disenfranchised. So the very quota system that was brought in to give them their own bit of the Garden of Eden, they no longer control, they no longer own it, and, and in many ways they're little more now than serfs in their own patch, which is not what the QMS was brought in for. It wasn't brought in to enrich and empower non-fishing quota holders. Um, so to fix the problems, briefly, we do need a, a comprehensive review. It needs to be independent of MPI. Um, there's a few things there that need to be dug into. Um, but we can also learn by looking at other countries. How do they deal with this? And, and reporting, electronic monitoring, particularly transparency. Most definitely a productivity um, commission of, of inquiry. Um, because it, I think the industry needs kind of guidance and also the public. How do we decommoditize our fishing industry? And I think there, there is a, a growing call out there for the get fisheries back the way it was with its own agency. But it needs to have far stronger oversight because there's no question in our journey that we've come to the determination the ministry is captured, industry captured, and that needs to change. So, looking at the positive side, just to wrap it up, what can a better way look like? I, I, I was interested when the news came out this morning about uh, what they're doing for Auckland and the waterfront. But where's the fishermen in the story? You know? They're not even mentioned. So what's going to happen to those guys? They're going to get pushed out, told to go to Lee or told to go to Coromandel? They should be front and centre of, of what's going on down at the viaduct somewhere. And, and maybe a market um, where we, we can demonstrate and show that connection between the boat the, sorry, the sea, the birds, the boat, and the plate. Why is it that I have to drive to Monganui to sit beside the, 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 on the wharf there to eat fish and, fresh fish and chips? Or go down to Fleurs in Otago to actually eat from a restaurant where I can see the boat delivering the fish? You know, it's crazy. We should have that bang in the, in the centre. The, the photo on the right there is actually the fisherman selling off the boat. And he's showing that lady, this is in San Francisco, where he caught the fish. It's the story. We need a vibrant, profitable industry. And hiding them in some uh, remote place and forcing them only to sell their fish through a licensed fish receiver in where the fish is trucked around the country is crazy. So another way of looking at it, as by Iceland, um, the fillet now is the byproduct. They don't look at it, our culture is, unless we can fill it and deep fry it, it's not worth anything. That culture needs to change. And it's not about high value byproducts. Iceland are 30 years ahead of us. Um, we could even start with a fisherman's wharf and then maybe go into some of these other things with the help of a productivity commissioner. Um, and that's, that's who Iceland's most important customers are now. It's not a fish shop. So finally, um, yesterday we, we've um, published this paper in the conversation. You might be interested. Gives a little bit more background of, of some of the um, issues that I've commented on today. I'd certainly encourage you to read it. Thank you.